Hello Grade Nines, welcome to today's MathsLit video lesson. I hope you all are doing well. And this week is once again going to be video lessons. And hopefully we see you guys for the face-to-face -face lessons next week. So we're going to be starting on a new section today. Collecting, organizing and summarizing data. You'll find this on page 270 of the textbook. So some of you guys might have already encountered this process from your expeditions online, uh, over the internet or YouTube. Uh, what you might discover is that the internet tracks you and is able to forward you ads and links that cater specifically for your tastes. So for example, if you like BMWs and you search a lot of BMW sites, uh, you may find ads and pop-ups that relate to BMW car dealerships or merchandise. So this process is uh, done nowadays by computers to handle the large volumes of data that come in and this process is automated. But in this section, we're going to be going over how to sort the data manually by hand. So we start off by looking at the data cycle. The data cycle is a process that we follow when statistic statistically trying to analyze a particular problem. So we start off with our problem. For example, we might be interested in how smoking by pregnant mothers might affect their unborn child. We have a plan. How are we going to measure the impact on the unborn child? Would we look at its weight at birth? For example, an unhealthier baby might weigh less than a healthy baby. Would we look at a factor like heart rate? Maybe the smoking impacts the heart rate of the unborn. Then we collect data. So we would uh, perhaps test a random sample of uh, mothers in various hospitals around the country, uh, see how much they smoke, what brands they're smoking, and look at the features of the newborns. Next, we go on to representing the data. How do we represent it in a way that we can understand? And that brings us to our final point, analyzing the data and drawing conclusions. So before we start, I just want to go through some of the terminology in this section. We have a population, which is the entire group um, of, of people or items or animals that we're interested in testing. So in our pregnant mothers who smoke example, it, our population would be all the pregnant mothers who smoke. Next, we have our sample. And this is a small group that we choose from the population for when we are testing. So our population might just be too large for us to test everybody. So experimentally, we just pick a small group of people to look at. Then we have two different kinds of sample, the random sample and a biased sample. So a random sample is where any member of the sample has an equal chance of being picked. So for our mothers that smoke example, a random sample would be if we picked mothers from all different um, income uh, positions. So you pick mothers from the high income and the low income. A biased sample would be if we picked from just a specific income group. So for example, if we're only testing mothers that come from wealthy areas like Sandton or Hyde Park, it might bias our sample because these mothers might overall have better access to health care and living conditions and their newborns might just be healthier. Whereas if uh, we just tested from a rural settlement, um, their living conditions and, and health care might be worse. So uh, naturally, the newborns uh, might be less healthy. So this would skew our interpretation of how the smoking, which is what we're interested in, affects the health of the newborns. So now that we've looked at some of the theory, let's jump into an example. I'm going to do the worked example on page 273. And it says that 40 learners wrote a maths test and their results in percentage terms were recorded in this table. So we have this table with a whole bunch of percentage values 
and we need to organize this data so that we can interpret it. So the tool that we're going to use is called the stem and leaf plot. So if you look at our percentages, it's made up of two digits, a tens digit and a units digit. So for example, if we look at the number 30, our tens digit is a three and our units digit is a zero. And in the stem and leaf plot, the tens digit will serve as our stem and the units digit as our leaves. So just think of a plant with a stem running down the middle and the leaves along the sides. So I've listed our stems over here. This would represent 20 and we go up 30, 40, all the way up to 70. And then we need to add in each of our leaves. So I'm just going to go through the first row of values and then I'll pause the video and fill in the rest of the table. So for the number 30, we have a uh, units digit of zero. So we plot it next to the three. Number 59, we put a nine along the five row. 62, Twenty-six, forty-seven, forty-five. 47, 45, sure, these learners look like they struggled, 37, and 23. Okay, so we just, we just plot uh, like that, row by row, and I'm just going to pause the video and finish the table. Here I've completed the stem and leaf plot for all 40 learners. And uh, the way I've done it as well, the way I've put the leaves is so that I could order these values from highest to lowest. So for example, if I got 49, I put the leaf nine all the way on the right hand side and I left space for the smaller values. So how does a stem and leaf plot help us? What can we interpret from this data? So the distribution of marks follows what we might expect in real life. You get some learners that do really badly, some learners that do really well, and the majority of the marks are somewhere in the middle. So we can see that pattern showing up here. There were a few learners who did very badly, got in the 20s, and there was one learner that did really well, got 76%. The majority of learners got in the 40s. So this was probably a difficult test um, if the majority got just below the 50% mark. So we can further summarize the results that we get from the stem and leaf plot in a frequency table. So our frequency table has a list of intervals. We've got 20 to 30, 30 to 40, all the way up to 70 to 80. So don't be scared by this notation. Uh, it's very straightforward. This is our x value. It represents the, the value in the interval. And it's just saying that um, the interval value must be less than 30 or greater than or equal to 20. So less than 30 means strictly less than 30. So the maximum value can be 29. And greater than or equal to 20 means uh, including the 20. So our minimum value uh, will be 20 and it'll go 21, 22, all the way up to 29. So similarly for the second interval, uh, our value is greater than or equal to 30. So that means it starts at 30 and it's strictly less than 40. So it goes up to a maximum of 39. So let's just count uh, these uh, frequencies. So from 20 to 29, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And for the next one, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And I'll just pause the video and fill in the rest. So this is our complete frequency table. And I've counted um, all the values that occur in the specific intervals. So the only thing to make sure of is that when we add all these numbers, we get back to 40. Because remember, there were 40 students that wrote. There were 40 values in the table. 
So let's quickly check. We've got 5 plus 8 is 13, plus 16 is 29, plus 1 is 30, plus another 10 gives us a total of 40. So if you've done all of this work and you see that your numbers don't add up to 40, then you know you've made an error somewhere. Either you've miscounted or you might have made a mistake where there were three values of 45. So if you check this table, there's 45, 45, 45. Um, and you might have accidentally put only two values. So now we're going to move on to some further measures that we use uh, to describe the data. Those are the central measures of tendency. So the measures of central tendency summarize the entire data set. And these are usually the middle values that indicate um, what the overall data set is doing. So for example, if we think of heights of students in grade nine, um, we would think of someone who's uh, of a middle height or a middle height value um, that averages out everybody. So let's look at each of these measures. We've got the median, which is the middle value of an ordered data set. So for example, if we had five values, say three, seven, uh, two, four, and eight, we would first have to order them. So we go two, three, four, seven, eight. And then we find the middle value, which is going to be four. Next, we have the mode. So the mode is the value that appears most often in a data set. So for example, if we have the numbers 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 4, these are ordered and the most common value in the data set is the number 4. Lastly, we have the mean, which is the average of all numbers in the data set. So this is easier expressed with an example than by describing it. So let's think of a data set, uh, one, four, seven, and six. So to find the mean, we add all these numbers together and divide it by the number of numbers. So in this case, we are dividing by four. So we work out our mean, as 1 plus 4 plus 7 plus 6 and we divide it by the number of values in the data set. So 1 plus 4 is 5, plus 7 is 12, plus 6 is 18, divided by 4 equals 4 and a half. Okay, so notice we can get fractions when we're working out the mean. So lastly, we're going to talk about measures of dispersion or in other words, how spread out the data is. So we start off by looking at the range and the range is the difference between the highest value and the lowest value. So equation reads highest value minus lowest value and that just shows us the difference between the two extremes. Then we have outliers and outliers are data points which differ from uh, the overall data points in our sample. So this is a simple diagram to show this. We have a scatter plot with an X and a Y axis and we can see that these three values uh, resemble one another, they form a little group and we have two outliers, one at the top and one at the bottom. So in our data sometimes we will include outliers, sometimes we will exclude them and the reason for excluding the outliers is that they may skew the overall uh, measures of central tendency. So, for example, if we were looking at the heights of the Odyssey Edenvale grade nines and we included Dalton's height, um, it would skew the overall average of the class height. So Dalton being very tall would raise the overall average of the class and that might be making the results a little bit biased. So that concludes the theory for this lesson, all of the terminology 
and all of the measures, all of the calculations. So now let's jump into an example. So we're going to look at the worked example at the bottom of page 274. And we have this table. I'll just list the columns and the first value. We've got a home, the number of pets, and the types of pets. So they're just looking at cat and dog. So we identify the homes. The homes are numbered from 1 to 10. So house number 1 has two pets and there's one cat and one dog. One plus one gives us two. For the second home, we have four pets and there are three cats and one dog. So I'm not gonna pull out the whole table. You've got it here in the textbook. Let's go through some of the questions. It asks us to determine the mode for the cat values. Um, for the cat data values, that's question A. So the mode is the most common value. So if we look at the values listed under the cat column, the largest number is four. Uh, sorry, uh, the most common value is three. There are one, two, three threes. Okay, so we would say the mode for cats um, mode is three and you can even put um, three values of three if you wanted to be specific for b it asks us to put the mode for the pets data values so we look at the pets we see there's uh, one there's two twos there's three fours two threes so the mode the most common value is going to be four equals four and there are three values of four so pretty straightforward c is asking for the median of the dog data values so we have to first order the values from lowest to highest and then find the middle value. So for the dog data values, um, the lowest value, or let me list them first. So it goes 1, 1, 2, 2, 0, 2, 2, 4, 1, 0. So we're going to order these starting from our lowest value 0 to our highest value 4. So there are two zeros. There's 1, 2, 3, 1s. 4, 2s. Sorry, yeah, 4, 2s. I'm confusing myself. 1, 2, 3, 4. And there is one value of 4. So let's count how many values there are. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And our median would be the, the number in the middle of 10 is going to be 4 and a half. Or sorry, 5 and a half. Uh, let's just check. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So our number lies in between these two values, it's in the middle. So the average between one and two is going to be one and a half. So next for D, we have the mean of the cat data values. <clears throat> So we calculate the mean by adding all the values together and then dividing by the total number of numbers. So for the cat data values, we have uh, the mean being equal to 1 plus 3 uh, plus 0. We don't really have to include the plus 0 because it won't affect our overall calculation. Uh, plus 2 
plus 3 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 0 and there were 10 values so you divide by 10 let's add this up we've got 1 plus 3 is 4 plus 2 is 6 plus 3 is 9 plus 1 is 10 plus 2 is 12 plus 3 is 15 plus 4 is 19 divided by 10 gives us 1.9 so next we go on to E and that's asking us to find the extremes for the dog data values so extremes means highest and lowest so the dog data values have a highest value of 4 so for the dog data values and a lowest value of 0 and the last question asks us to find the range of the dog data values so range is highest value minus lowest value so for f range for the dog equals to the highest which is 4 minus the lowest which is 0 gives us a final answer of 4. So that concludes today's video lesson. I'm going to send out a couple of questions on this on the parents group and our WhatsApp group. I hope you guys understood and once again if you didn't understand anything or would like me to go over something please send a message. Thanks.